Toda, toda. Uh, Animit Steyr, hans uh, beamer. <laughs> uh, I knew I was coming to uh, Israel and I know that you folks are always very formal. So I was like, I'm going to wear a tie. I like, that's a good idea. I did. But then I tried Houdini and the rainbow ties and then this happened. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, but anyway, um, who of you... Who of you have used uh, the following product? This is um, Outlook, Webmail, uh, but the, the new version, which is currently in uh, beta. Anybody used it yet? I saw someone. There's actually a button where you can try it if you're using uh, Outlook. But it's an uh, interesting product for a reason. Another question. Who did ever play Battlefield? Five or one? So those two products have something interesting in common. Both are using React, and both are using Mobix to manage their state. And that might be quite surprising to you, and you must be maybe like, oh, that must really make you happy. That is kind of true, but there's something that really sparks a joy in me, and that is the following. People that put on really lovely suits. <laughs> and I can basically go on forever. <laughs> but my question in the end is, Bruce Lawson, Lama, Kaga, Gazak. <laughs> So anyway, I want to talk about uh, a few random things um, you might already uh, know for a long time, um, but just I want to reiterate them shortly because they're relevant for the rest of this talk. And so um, there's this concept of pure functions. And pure function is very interesting because it uh, means that like, if you pass in the same argument, then it produces the same output, and beyond that, Nothing in the rest of the world did change. And they are very interesting because they can be uh, memoized, and more importantly, um, for optimization, they can actually be substituted. So everywhere in your code base where you have like the sum of two and three, you could immediately put in like five. You couldn't leave out the whole function call. Something else random. Who likes Texas? <laughs> Nobody, right? Um, but without them, it's basically impossible to uh, build a really well-functioning country. So you kind of have to have them, although we all hate them. And this was like a fitting picture. <laughs> so there are also functions that aren't pure, but that have uh, side effects. So for example, if we put in a log statement in the function we saw before, it means that suddenly we cannot substitute this function call away anymore because it would change the semantics of the application. And so basically we want to say like, side effects are bad, you shouldn't do them. But the problem is that we often need them. We need them for uh, rendering, drawing things on screen, network requests, uh, operating with the file system. And so we need them, but they're hard to test. They're hard to like, control and isolate, and you need to stop all kinds of APIs to uh, work with them in test. It's annoying. But the point is that like, without them, it's impossible to build a meaningful application. If your application cannot output anything, what is the point of it? It always needs to store something somewhere, show something on your screen, visualize something, so without them, it's impossible to build a meaningful application. Back to the pure functions. Is this function pure or impure? It filters over a bunch of to-dos and then says how many of them are remaining. And by looking at this function, you cannot tell. Because it depends on what the, oh, that doesn't work, what the parameter is doing. Is to-dos, is it an uh, immutable object? then this function is pure, because then the output is perfectly predictable. If the to-dos object is a mutable thing that like could change over time, then this is an impure function. 
The problem, however, is like, um, if this to-do's object is immutable, it does make it more simple to reason about this function specifically, but it means that we pushed just mutability into some other place. Because in the end, there's always some place where there's a mutabil uh, mutability in your application. Otherwise, you can't have state. The meaning of state is that things can change over time. Sometimes I hear people talk about the concept of immutable state management. It doesn't exist. There's state management with immutable values. But state is always about mutability somewhere. So if you're using, for example, Redux, the Redux store itself is mutable so that you can, you can listen to it and change what it's storing. So state requires mutability. And again, like with side effects, without mutability, it's impossible to build a meaningful application. So mutability and side effects, we, we hate them kind of for very good reasons. They kind of the root of all evil, the root of all complexity. But on the other hand, they're also at the heart of every valuable process. So what is state management? State management is no more than controlling the mutability and the side effects of your application in a meaningful, more organized way. It's just trying to like make life better for problems we already have. Another side step, reactive programming. There are many, many different definitions about what reactive programming is, but here's my take on it. Reactive programming is specifically about controlling side effects. There's an interesting definition um, by Heinrich Apfelmus, awesome name I think. The essence of functional reactive programming is to specify the dynamic behavior of a value completely at the time of declaration. That sounds a bit fake, so let's give a quick example. So often we are managing our side effects in our application in a bit imperative way. So for example, we are uh, printing the state of a, uh, how many times there was clicked, and we want to debounce that, and then we introduce um, state like the, when the last click was, and then we have all this imperative logic to take care of this. And so there's a lot of moving places in, uh, in here. A lot of codes being stateful, being hard to test. So with a library like ArcGIS, we can make that um, better. There's still a side effect in here, but it's just a smaller part. We organized it in a better way. And the other parts, they are now easier to test. So it's uh, just about controlling it better. Again, an entire change of subject. And this brings me actually to the actual talk. And it's the question, where does state live? And in this talk, um, I'm going to use React as an example, but it basically the question applies to any technology you use to uh, build your uh, application. And so let's start with the simplest case. Let's say that you have a React component or components in any other uh, tool, and it might have local component state. And since uh, hooks are hyped currently, um, let's use hooks this time. And for those who didn't see hooks, here's a like uh, 10 seconds introduction to them. There is this uh, magic, mag magic function, use state, and you give it a value, and then it returns you something, a tuple, which returns you A, the current value, so that's basically the value you just put into it, and B, it returns you a function. And a function, that's the interesting part, because if you call it and you, you give it a value, then that's the new value that will be stored. And then it will also cause the very same component to render again. And because that component is rendering again, this use state thing is called again, and it's going again to return a tuple, but this time it won't return you the initial value, now it will return you the value you passed in previously. Now, 
if you're not used to it, I can see why you're thinking, wow, that's an awkward model. Um, but actually, it's pretty convenient to work with uh, in practice. It's very interesting. Anyway, um, so I did build a uh, demo for that. And I'm going to try to switch to the other window, but I'm not used to Mac, so anything can happen now. Okay. <laughs> So there are some, uh, some, some bruises over here. <laughs> and the idea is that I can pick up any of them and just uh, drag them around. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> there will be more later on when we go back to the demo. Be prepared. <laughs> and so what does that application uh, basically look like? Well, I had actually five demos for this talk, but now I just uploaded one for this one. Um, so in the initial demo, you would only see two circles. And that's because in our application, we're calling the circle component twice. And then that component is using use state um, and uses a, a, dra a drag library. And the handler of the drag library just calls the set circle function to update the local state of the circle being stored. So that's why the drag and drop works. And so React hooks, they are kind of a neat minimal abstraction to uh, introduce local state uh, in a component. As you saw, the function is like super side effectful because it remembers how you called it last time. But it's nice because it creates a nice black box of your state. And if you look at it from a conceptual point of view, and this is your component tree, it means that if you are dragging this circle around, then that circle is being repainted because it owns the state and it redraws based on that. Now let's take it a bit further. Let's add a bunch of uh, new features. For example, like being able to add new circles to this application. Uh, or exchanging uh, changes with a server, like sending the circles to the server, but also like receiving them. Maybe it's a multi-user application. So what would that mean? It means that you would like introduce a component that has a um, owns a collection of those circles. And it also means that you have to manage some side effects, like setting changes and changes and receiving them. And so now, back to the same demo, because that is all happening in this demo. So every five seconds, a new bruise appears. Imagine happening that in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> and also, the changes uh, are sent to the uh, server, and they're uh, ar arriving there. The interesting thing is, like, how does that work from a code perspective? So you can imagine that, like, um, when you capture the state of a set of circles, it might look like this. Um, in this case, I used a map with circles. It could also have been an array, it doesn't really matter. And so they stored under their own ID and they capture the uh, coordinates. So this is now the entire state of my application. And then I uh, wrote a reducer that has two actions available. One is uh, move and the other one is uh, add. Um, and so I'm spreading out objects, and um, that's a lot of work. I'm not even sure if this is correct. Um, but anyway, um, if you're like, oh, that's a lot of code, you can also write it like this. Um, this is using the Ember package, which is using proxies, and um, gives you a mutable API to do immutable stuff. And actually, Jean Linquist was going to talk about that at this time, so that's why I, like, I now share it quickly with you. But it's totally unrelated to my talk further. But it's really cool. Try it out. Anyway, um, so you can imagine that like our app component at the root now is going to create a circles component. And the circles component is now the one which is going to own the state. So it uses the reducer I just defined and the initial state. And then I get back the current state and the dispatch function so that I can um, execute the actions. At that point, I can um, 
create basically the event handlers that um, dispatch the, the relevant actions and pass them down to the circle components. So I'm looping over the circles in my state, and for each of them I um, pass the, the state of a specific circle to a specific circle component. That also means that like the circle component itself becomes simpler because it already receives all the data and the event handlers and it doesn't have to manage any state of its own because that moved to the parent. And there's one interesting thing here I want to point out is that we can all also memoize this function. We can treat this component as being pure because since we are using immutable um, state, we know for sure that if we get the very same uh, circle, we don't need to re-render. So that's great, that's a nice optimization. I told you that we also want to introduce some side effects. Uh, so here uh, are the two side effects. Um, one is that once a drag ends, so not while we are dragging, but when it ends, we want to send um, the updated state to the server. And secondly, we also um, set up a socket connection to the server and receive those changes. The implementation of that isn't uh, relevant, but what's interesting is the wiring. So because this circle, circles component, owns the state, we have to give that dispatch function to be able to uh, add new circles to that listener. Well, the same demo, so... Uh, Conceptually, what we did is we moved the state up to the tree. So those circles don't own their own state anymore. No, it moved up to the, to the circles component. And the others just received them. That also means that like, if you're moving a circle around, then since the state of the owning circles component uh, owns the state, that's the one that needs to like, uh, recompute and redraw and then send all the relevant circles down the tree again. So now we have two components re-rendering instead of one before. But the cool thing is, of course, we can now also add new circles. Let's add another feature to this application. Let's add lines. I oh, know, this gets really Bruce fancy. And so you can imagine that like the state we start with now gets a, bit, a little more complicated. So our initial state is a, a set of circles, we saw it before, and a set of lines. And each line has only two properties, the ID of the circle uh, it starts and the ID of the circle it ends. So that's straightforward enough. But then we also need to like, reflect it in our UI, so let's introduce a component that draws all the, uh, all the lines. And then we figure that like, to draw the lines, we need to know about the circles. So the lines component needs to have access to the state of the circles, right? Otherwise, we don't know where they live. So to fix that, we can take two different approaches. So to render a line, we need to know about the coordinates of the circles. So what we could do is like, every time a move action is fired, we, we go through the state and we also uh, copy those coordinates to the relevant lines. I think that's a bad idea because that introduces a lot of redundant data and um, expensive actions. So let's do it differently. Let's derive our, uh, those coordinates during render. So you might be wondering, does this also mean like that we have to move the state again to a different component? And yeah, the answer is yes. So like every time we introduce a new feature, we have to put our state somewhere else. I think that is awkward. awkward. So one conclusion you could draw is that like black boxes are really good for encapsulation, but it also makes uh, sharing state really hard. And probably most of the state you have in your application is kind of local and it's perfect fine to, to black box it. But it's also the state where it's where your whole application is about, like in this case circles and lines, but could also be orders or messages or profiles or users, that come back in all different kind of places. And so 
if sharing is hard, then that complicates things. Anyway, so we are improving our application again, and now all the state lives in the app component, so the root one. Um, it's just moving code, it doesn't change too much, circles are still the same. And we also introduce a new lines component, which is receiving all the lines and all the circles, because we need to compute the coordinates. And so then it gets interesting. So the lines, well, they pretty straightforward map over the lines. But the line component itself, it first has to grab the right circle from the collection, and then it can do its um, drawing. Oh, yeah, so. And so you can see that it works. So um, if I move a, a circle around, then the lines move with it. So those changes all propagate nicely. Cool. Um, but, and now this might can fail by not doing it on my own laptop, but if you go to the development tools. Okay, so, so here's something interesting. If you click that button and you highlight the updates, let's see what happens. Okay, it goes totally wild. If I drag one of these bruises, basically all of my application starts to re-render. And actually, it might now crash the dev tools. There's too many bruises in this window. Quickly, go away. <laughs> and so, at this point, it's like, why is it re-rendering all of the application? And here's the answer. So let's go back to this concept again. So again, we move the state up. We move the circles up, we move the lines up. And from there on, um, actually not all the application was redrawing. All the circles that weren't moved, they still stayed in place. Um, the problem was that all the lines are redrawing. Why? Because by adding a circle, we modified the circles collection. That collection needs to be passed down to the lines, but to all of the lines, because it might be their circle that was affected. So we see all those lines going uh, totally crazy. Can we fix that? Yes, of course we can fix this. Um, so we can make Memo a little bit smarter, and we say like, hey, um, let's do a little bit more intelligent thing. Um, let's specify exactly when you need to redraw. So we can say, like, um, if the previous line object is the same as the next line object and the circles they are pointing to are also still the same, then we can uh, build out. Now, this works, and this does solve the problem. However, the problem I have is that I, me and my computer, we have rules of engagement. The first one is that a video connection should work. The second one is that, like, the computer is doing the dumb stuff, I'm doing the smart stuff. And if I write a component of four lines, and then I'm writing eight lines of optimization code, then I'm violating that rule. That's like, that's my computer's job. It, that should be better at it. Luckily, um, we can hack around this and avoid this. We could also have solved it this way. What we do is like, we make the lines component responsible for looking up um, the right circles. So that at least um, keeps things a little bit more simple. But in my opinion, now the abstraction starts to leak. Because like, why should the component that is responsible for drawing a set of lines know how that it needs to look up circles? So this fixes the, the performance, but I don't think it's better. Anyway, um, if I had the demo, then I could have shown you that this solved the issue. And so then our graph looks a little bit better because only the right line would redraw. Let's again change subject. Let's talk, let's talk about external observable state. And before we do that, here's a philosophical, philosopher. you know what I want to say. <laughs> what is a component? There are two takes on it. One is you could say a component is a, um, slice of application, it's a um, 
black box self-contained concept responsible for its own state, uh, its own uh, side effects. And this is the take that um, basically any framework takes, or at least um, it's the concept that any framework makes it easy to take. On the other hand, you could say like a component that's just a tiny part of my uh, visualization, of my UI representation. Um, but actually, if you look at my application feature-wise, I might very well use the very same feature in many different contexts. I might use it in, uh, in UI, but when I'm testing, I'm interacting with it differently. Um, maybe I'm packaging the, the logic and uh, also using it in some other framework or on server side. And so, you could also like say, well, components are just about UI, and I keep the rest, especially like the domain specific stuff that has to be on server and such, I keep that separate. And I think that's a, a very interesting approach, which is especially uh, very scalable. And so the uh, author of uh, XState um, says this about it. Model and develop your ap application's logic as if it will be used in many different UIs. Why? Because it makes sure that you're not accidentally coupling your logic with uh, how it's represented. An, int an interesting effect it has is that like, if you're writing your unit test and you're always reasoning about components, then your unit tests start to behave like a human, like they start to click buttons and fire events and those kind of things. Um, but if you take the other approach, then your unit tests, they start to behave like an API consumer. They're just calling your uh, logical methods. And it might actually be the case that testing components isn't that interesting at all anymore. Anyway, um, so these are two entirely different philosophies. Uh, and one is not per se better than the other. Um, but I just wanted to make you aware of this difference. Now, if you go the path of state living outside the components, so the, so the shared state I'm talking about, how does the UI stay up to date? It doesn't know about it. The answer is, observe all the things. We started actually with the answer. So we can subscribe to changes, to changes and update the UI as a side effect, because UI is in the end a side effect. And for that, we have reactive programming. Reactive programming allows us to control side effects in a very well controlled manner. So you could use uh, Redux, RxJS, or in this case, Mobix for it. So Mobix, I'm not going, really going to explain it. Um, there's a workshop tomorrow if you're interested. But this is the gist of it. So you have some state, you make it observable, and then you start using that state in some side effect. After that point, Mobix will make sure that the side effect is executed exactly and only when relevant state did change. So that makes like the when question uh, declarative. Back to the demo application. How do we make the state observable? Well, we just pass it through uh, the observable function, and then we get the very same data tree back, uh, but this time it has observable capabilities. And then our functions, they become pretty straightforward because observable data is mutable, and that makes the mental mapping between what we're trying to achieve and what we are changing smaller. The interesting thing is then, we, our app components then become stateless. Why? Because, well, we just can create a state outside the whole component tree. And we can test it and do things with it and only then start to concern about UI. So we pass in the state and the rest of it uh, pretty much stays the same. The interesting thing is that like on our components, instead of using memo, we now start to use, so memo from React, we now start to use observer from the Mobix React bindings. And what it does, it's, it looks at your render, it, take, it tracks your render and says like, oh, in your render you were using these and these objects. These are the things I'm going to uh, subscribe to and going to react to. And so the cool thing is that now like both our app 
and our circle and our lines component, they all become basically stateless. They just, you could read them as templates. That's basically all they are now. Now you might notice is that we went back to our naive, slow implement, implementation of the line. Again, we are looking up the related circles in this line component. So the question is, do we again have a very slow application that is like redrawing all over the place? The answer, I could demo on my lap, <laughs> so visit me afterwards if you want to see it, but the answer is no. Actually, with these changes, only the circle and the affected line components are re-rendering. Not even the circles and the lines components are re-rendering anymore. And our state lives entirely outside the tree. And so, you might be wondering, what happened there? And so, the idea of immutable data, especially in UI, has often been that, like, we can better optimize it. But that's not entirely true. So, how can we optimize render? When we started with the immutable data, we were able to um, memo the line because we know for sure that if the line and circles are references didn't change, we know that they are deep equal. So that means that we don't need to re-render. What Observer does is it also applies memo. That sounds weird because it's mutable. But it also uh, applies auto run. That's the function that takes automatically care of side effects. And so the reasoning why this works is like, why can we memoize line? Well, because the observability guarantees something. It guarantees that like, as long as this component is receiving the very same line, of the very same set of circles, well, they might have changed because they're immutable. We don't know. But if they did change, we know for sure that that auto run function would have picked that up. So we can again uh, memo the component itself. And then there's another interesting effect. Because like, if the state is immutable and you change a single circle, you also need to change the collection that contains it. And you also need to change the root state. Right? You get all those new references to new objects. And so it means that also the memoization on the parent components was invalidated, and that's why the circle component re-renders, even though it's basically the same set. However, if data is mutable and observable, it means that if a circle changes, just the circle changes. You don't need to change the set that contains them, because it's the same reference. And so the circle set isn't touched. So that means that like no memoization of any of the parents needs invalidation. So that is why um, mutability can actually be faster. And so um, once your state is external, you can also move your effects uh, external. So that means that you can also like make those individually testable. And I think you can believe that, I, that we can do that because we can just move function out because the wiring isn't happening in the components anymore. The interesting thing is that like this way, all our functions don't need state anymore and they don't need side effects anymore. And so there are some interesting conclusions to draw from that. So first of all, there's this philosophical question. Um, is a component a slice of UI or a slice of application? Secondly, it's like um, immutable data is, I think, always better than immutable data. It's simpler to reason about and it has interesting uh, properties. However, if your data is intended to be stateful and your data is mutable and observable, it's both faster and more straightforward. A question I get a lot lately is like, does React still need state management solutions like uh, Redux or Mobix? And I think the answer is yes, because React uh, and ho hooks and context, they didn't change the capabilities of React fundamentally. They just provided a much, much better API. Some people concluded like, 
since I'm using hooks and contexts, I don't need Redux anymore. Well, that might be the case, but that basically means that you didn't need it before. So when do you need state management? When is it useful? First of all, um, the, be the primary use case is being able to manage state outside your component tree. When is that relevant? When you have larger, more complicated apps where state is used in many different places uh, or in different settings. So because of the decoupling, it makes both the uh, effects and the domain state better manageable, better testable. There is, uh, of course, in any application also like the more volatile UI-only state, like a selection in a radio button list or something. Do keep that in your components, then you can benefit from REC features that improve that in the future. <laughs> but the most important conclusion from this talk is like, if you need happiness, go to whatsbrucewearingtoday.tumblr.com <laughs> and you will have a happier day. Thank you.